the forgotten traditions of how Rome crowned their early kings, revealed. Brace yourself for an exclusive inside look into the forgotten traditions and customs surrounding the coronation of Rome's earliest monarchs. Prepare to be astounded by the shocking revelations that have remained hidden for centuries. Introducing the ultimate voiceover tool for professionals and amateurs, a powerful and easy-to-use software that lets you easily create high-quality voiceovers, the Roman Kingdom, also known as the Roman Monarchy or the Regal Period of Ancient Rome, was the earliest period of Roman history when the city and its territory were ruled by kings. According to tradition, the Roman Kingdom began with the city's founding around 753 BC, with settlements around the Palatine Hill along the river Tiber in central Italy, and ended with the overthrow of the kings and the establishment of the Republic around 509 BC. The kings who came after Romulus, the city's founder, were chosen by the people of Rome to serve for life, and they didn't need to rely on military force to gain or keep the throne. The only king who broke this tradition completely was Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the last king. According to tradition, he seized power from his predecessor and ruled as a tyrant. The insignia of the kings of Rome were twelve lictors, attendants or servants, carrying the symbolic fasces with axes, the right to sit on a curule seat, the purple toga picta, red shoes, and a white diadem around the head. Out of all these insignia, the most important one was the purple toga picta. The king was granted supreme military, executive, and judicial authority through the use of imperium, which was formally given to the king by the curiate assembly with the passing of the Lex Curiata de Imperio at the beginning of each king's reign. The king held imperium for life, which protected him from ever being brought to trial for his actions. Since the king was the sole owner of imperium in Rome at that time, he had ultimate executive power and unchecked military authority as the commander-in-chief of all the Roman legions. It's important to note that the laws that safeguarded citizens from magistrates' misuse of imperium did not exist during the monarchical period. The king had the power to appoint or nominate all officials to office. For instance, the king would appoint a tribunus celerum to serve as both the tribune of the Ramnus tribe in Rome and as the commander of the king's bodyguard, the Celeris. The appointment of the tribune was mandatory upon the king's assumption of office, and the tribune would leave office upon the king's death. The tribune held the second highest rank after the king and also had the power to convene the curiate assembly and propose legislation. Another officer appointed by the king was the prefectus urbi, who acted as the warden of the city. In the king's absence from the city, the prefect assumed all of the king's powers and abilities, including being bestowed with imperium while inside the city. Additionally, the king had the exclusive right to appoint patricians to the Senate. What is known for certain is that the king alone possessed the right to the augury on behalf of Rome as its chief augur, and no public business could be performed without the will of the gods made known through auspices. The people knew the king as a mediator between them and the gods, see Latin pontifex, bridge builder, in this sense, between men and the gods, and thus viewed the king with religious awe. This made the king the head of the national religion and its chief executive. Having the power to control the Roman calendar, he conducted all religious ceremonies and appointed lower religious offices and officers. It is said that Romulus himself instituted the augurs and was believed to have been the best augur of all. Likewise, King Numa Pompilius instituted the pontiffs and through them developed the foundations of the religious dogma of Rome. Under the rule of the kings, the Senate and Curiate Assembly didn't have much power or authority. They weren't independent because they couldn't meet and discuss state matters freely. They could only be summoned by the king and could only discuss the issues that the king presented to them. While the Curiate Assembly could pass laws proposed by the king, the Senate was more of an honorary council. It could offer advice to the king, but it couldn't prevent him from taking action. The only thing the king couldn't do without the approval of the Senate and the Curiate Assembly was declare war against another country. The king's imperium not only granted him military powers, but also qualified him to pronounce legal judgment in all cases as the chief justice of Rome. Though he could assign pontiffs to act as minor judges in some cases, 
He had supreme authority in all cases brought before him, both civil and criminal. This made the king supreme in times of both war and peace. Some writers believed there was no appeal from the king's decisions, while others believed that a proposal for appeal could be brought before the king by any patrician during a meeting of the curiate assembly. To assist the king, a council advised him during all trials, but this council had no power to control his decisions. How interesting. Additionally, two criminal detectives, Quaestors Parasiti, were appointed by him, as well as a two-man criminal court, Dum Viri Perduilionis, which oversaw cases of treason. According to Livy, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, the seventh and final king of Rome, judged capital criminal cases without the advice of counselors, thereby creating fear amongst those who might think to oppose him. Whenever a king passed away, Rome would enter a period of interregnum. During this time, the Senate would take on the responsibility of finding a new king. The Senate would gather and appoint one of its members, known as the Interrex, to serve for five days with the sole purpose of nominating the next king of Rome. If no nominee was chosen within five days, the Interrex, with the Senate's approval, would appoint another senator to take over for another five-day term. This process would continue until a new king was elected. Once the Interrex found a suitable nominee for the kingship, they would present the nominee to the Senate for review. If the Senate approved the nominee, the Interrex would oversee the king's election by the Curiate Assembly. However, the king-elect would not immediately assume office. There were still two more steps that needed to be completed before the nominee could be invested with full regal authority. The people of Rome would have the final say in accepting or rejecting the nominee proposed by the Curiate Assembly. If accepted, the king-elect would still need to go through the remaining acts before assuming the role of king. First, let's make sure we get the divine will of the gods regarding his appointment through the auspices, since the king will also serve as the high priest of Rome. This ceremony is performed by an augur, who takes the king-elect to the citadel, where he sits on a stone seat while the people wait below. If the augur determines that the king is worthy, they announce that the gods have given favorable signs, confirming the king's priestly role. The next step is to confer the imperium upon the king. The previous vote by the curiate assembly only determined who would be king, but it didn't grant the necessary power to the king. So the king proposes a law to the curiate assembly, granting him imperium, and the assembly grants it by voting in favor of the law. In theory, the people of Rome elect their leader, but the Senate has most of the control over the... According to legend, Romulus established the Senate after he founded Rome by personally handpicking the most noble men, wealthy men with legitimate wives and children, to serve as a council for the city. So you could say that the Senate was like the king's trusted advisors kind of like a council of state. The Senate was made up of 300 senators, with 100 senators representing each of the three ancient tribes of Rome, the Ramnas, Latins, Tities, Sabines, and Luceris, Etruscans. Within each tribe, a senator was chosen from each of the tribe's ten curia. Now the king had the sole authority to appoint the senators, but he did it by ancient custom. Under the monarchy, the Senate didn't have much power or authority because the king held most of the political power. But hey, the Senate did have a role to play. They were the king's council and helped coordinate legislation. When the king proposed a law and it passed the Curiat Assembly, the Senate could either veto it or accept it. The king was supposed to ask the Senate for advice on important matters, but he could pick and choose what to bring to them and do whatever he wanted with their advice. Only the king could call a senate meeting, except during the interregnum, when the senate could do it themselves. As we delve deeper into the annals of history, we uncover the remarkable legacies of Rome's seven legendary monarchs. Join us on this captivating journey as we unravel the stories of these iconic figures who shaped the foundations of one of the world's greatest civilizations. Son of the Vestal Virgin, Rhea Silvia, Supposedly by the god Mars, the legendary Romulus was the founder and first king of Rome. After he and his twin brother Remus had overthrown King Amulius of Alba and restored their grandfather Numitor to the throne, they decided to build a city in the area where they had been abandoned as babies. 
Unfortunately, a dispute between the brothers led to the tragic demise of Remus. Undeterred, Romulus embarked on the construction of the city on the Palatine Hill, starting with fortifications. In a remarkable display of inclusivity, he welcomed people from all walks of life to become citizens of Rome, regardless of their social status. Romulus is widely recognized for establishing the city's religious, legal, and political institutions. The kingdom was established with unanimous support, as Romulus called upon the citizens to gather for a council to determine their government. Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, had the brilliant idea of establishing the Senate as an advisory council. He handpicked 100 of the most noble men in the community, whom he affectionately called patres, meaning fathers or heads. These distinguished individuals and their descendants would later become known as the patricians. To exude authority, Romulus surrounded himself with a loyal entourage, including twelve lictors. Additionally, he organized the horsemen into three divisions, known as centuries, Ramnus, Romans, Tities, named after the Sabine king, and Lucerus, Etruscans. Furthermore, Romulus divided the populace into thirty curia, which were named after the brave Sabine women who played a crucial role in ending the war between Romulus and Tadius. These curia served as the voting units in the popular assemblies, known as the Comitia Curiata. Romulus played a major role in one of the most infamous events in Roman history, commonly referred to as the Rape of the Sabine Women. To find wives for his citizens, Romulus extended an invitation to neighboring tribes for a festival in Rome. However, during this festival, the Romans carried out a mass abduction of young women from among the attendees. The number of women taken varies from 30 to 683, which is quite significant considering the population of 3,000 Latins, and presumably the Sabines as well. A conflict arose when Romulus refused to release the captives. Eventually, during the Battle of the Lacus Curtius, the women themselves intervened to bring an end to the war after the Sabines made three unsuccessful attempts to invade the hill settlements of Rome. As a result, the two peoples were united under a joint kingdom, with Romulus and the Sabine king Titus Tadius sharing the throne. Apart from the war with the Sabines, Romulus also engaged in conflicts with the Phytonates, Veientes, and other groups. After Romulus passed away, there was a brief period of transition for one year. During this time, ten individuals from the Senate were selected to govern Rome as successive interreges. Responding to the wishes of the people, the Senate ultimately decided to appoint the esteemed Sabine Numa Pompilius as the successor to Romulus, due to his well-known reputation for fairness and devotion. This decision was warmly embraced by the Curiate Assembly. Numa's reign was a time of peace and religious reform. He built a brand new temple to Janus, and after making peace with Rome's neighbors, he closed the doors of the temple to symbolize a state of peace. Those doors stayed closed for the entire duration of his reign. Numa also established the Vestal Virgins in Rome, as well as the Sali and the Flamines for Jupiter, Mars, and Quirinus. He even created the position and responsibilities of Pontifex Maximus. Numa ruled for an impressive 43 years. He made changes to the Roman calendar by adjusting it to account for the solar and lunar years, and he also added the months of January and February to make a total of 12 months. Tullus Hostilius was quite the warrior, just like Romulus, but he had a different approach compared to Numa, as he didn't hold much respect for the gods. Tullus engaged in battles against Alba Longa, Fidene, Vei, and the Sabines. Under Tullus's rule, the city of Alba Longa was destroyed, and its population was assimilated into Rome. Tullus is credited with constructing a new home for the Senate, known as the Curia Hostilia, which stood for an impressive 562 years after his passing. According to Livy, Tullus didn't pay much attention to the worship of the gods until the end of his reign, when he fell ill and became superstitious. However, when Tullus called upon Jupiter and pleaded for assistance, Jupiter responded with a lightning bolt that reduced the king and his house to ashes. His reign lasted for a total of 32 years. After the mysterious death of Tullus, the Romans elected a peaceful and religious king in his place, Numa's grandson, Ancus Martius. Similar to his grandfather, Ancus focused on defending Rome's territory rather than expanding its borders. He also constructed Rome's first prison on the Capitoline Hill. 
Ancus further fortified the Janiculum Hill on the western bank and built the first bridge across the Tiber River. He also founded the port of Ostia Antica on the Tyrrhenian Sea and established Rome's first salt works as well as the city's first aqueduct. Rome grew as Ancus used diplomacy to peacefully unite smaller surrounding cities into alliance with Rome. Thus, he completed the conquest of the Latins and relocated them to the Aventine Hill, thus forming the plebeian class of Romans. He died a natural death like his grandfather, after twenty-five years as king, marking the end of Rome's Latin Sabine kings. Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, the fifth king of Rome and the first of Etruscan birth, was quite an impressive ruler. After immigrating to Rome, he quickly gained favor with Ancus, who even adopted him as his son. Once he took the throne, Priscus fearlessly led wars against the Sabines and Etruscans, resulting in Rome's size doubling and the city being filled with incredible treasures. To accommodate the growing population, he made sure to populate the Aventine and Celian hills. One of Priscus's first reforms was to expand the Senate by adding 100 new members from the conquered Etruscan tribes, bringing the total number of senators to 200. With the acquired treasures, he embarked on ambitious building projects for Rome. Among these remarkable structures were the city's great sewer systems, known as the Cloaca Maxima, which he cleverly used to drain the swamp-like area between the seven hills of Rome. In its place, he began constructing the magnificent Roman Forum. And let's not forget, he also founded the Roman Games. Priscus was a visionary when it came to building. He started with the city's first bridge, the Pons Sublicius, and went on to create the famous Circus Maximus, a colossal stadium dedicated to exhilarating chariot races. Additionally, he initiated the construction of a temple fortress dedicated to the god Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. Unfortunately, before its completion, Priscus met his untimely demise at the hands of a son of Ancus Martius after an impressive 38-year reign. Nevertheless, his legacy lives on as he introduced the Roman symbols of military and civil offices, as well as the Roman triumph, becoming the first Roman to celebrate one. Priscus was succeeded by his son-in-law, Servius Tullius, who happened to be Rome's second king of Etruscan birth and the son of a slave. Just like his father-in-law, Servius engaged in successful wars against the Etruscans. He cleverly utilized the spoils of war to construct the very first wall encircling the seven hills of Rome, known as the Pomerium. Additionally, he took charge of reorganizing the army. Under Servius Tullius' leadership, a brand new constitution was introduced, which further developed the citizen classes. As part of this, Rome's inaugural census was established, dividing the population into five economic classes and forming the Centuriate Assembly. By utilizing the census, Servius divided the population into four urban tribes based on their location, thereby establishing the tribal assembly. Furthermore, he oversaw the construction of the magnificent Temple of Diana on the Aventine Hill. Servius's reforms brought about a significant change in Roman society, as voting rights were now based on socioeconomic status, favoring the elites. However, as time went on, Servius increasingly showed favoritism towards the poor to gain support from the plebeians, often at the expense of the patricians. Unfortunately, after a remarkable reign of 44 years, Servius fell victim to a conspiracy orchestrated by his daughter Tullia and her husband Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. The seventh and final king of Rome was Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. He was the son of Priscus and the son-in-law of Servius, whom he and his wife had killed. Tarquinius waged several wars against Rome's neighbors, including against the Volsci, Gabi, and the Rutuli. He also made sure Rome remained the head of the Latin cities. He even took on a series of public works like completing the Temple of Jupiter, Optimus Maximus, and working on the Cloaca Maxima and the Circus Maximus. However, Tarquin's reign is remembered for his use of violence and intimidation to control Rome and his disrespect for Roman cus customs, the Roman Senate. Things reached a boiling point when the king's son, Sextus Tarquinius, raped Lucretia, the wife and daughter of powerful Roman nobles. Lucretia told her relatives about the attack and tragically took her own life to avoid the dishonor of the situation. Four men, led by Lucius Junius Brutus and Uding Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus, Publius Valerius Poplicola, and Spurius Lucretius Trisipitinus, sparked a revolution that removed and banished Tarquinius and his family from Rome 
in 509 BC. Tarquin was so disliked that the word for king, rex, had a negative meaning in the Latin language until the fall of the Roman Empire. Lucius Junius Brutus and Lucius Tarquinius Collatinus became Rome's first consuls, marking the start of the Roman Republic. This new government would last for the next 500 years until the rise of Julius Caesar and Augustus. It would cover a period when Rome's influence and control extended to vast areas of Europe, North Africa, and West Asia. He ruled for 25 years, 